I'm going to be discussing the, um, well, our experience in uh, migrating our an existing production cluster from a green enzyme scheduler to a moad and torque scheduling environment. So just to put some context you know, before my presentation, I talk a bit about the, the actual machine. Uh, you know, what it does, what it's part of, what kind of users we have. Uh, I talk about our rationale for moving a production system to a new scheduling environment and uh, the transition steps that we've taken. And at the end, I come, I'll finish with the status update of where we are at. So this is nowhere near a finished project. It's an ongoing uh, migration that will be going on for the next couple of weeks. So, really quick us, which is the name of our, uh, our system. Uh, it's an old uh, ex particle accelerator that was uh, used for a couple of years, so we re recycled it into a data center. So, it's pretty different than what we usually see. It's a, in a circular model. We have room for 56 racks, about 1 gigawatt of power and cooling, and UPS and power generator for the uh, management nodes and the, uh, the pipe system. So basically, instead of having uh, hot house and cold house as you see in child data centers, we basically have all the, the, the racks around in a circular fashion facing out, and all the servers take the cold air from the uh, outside cold air pinion, and they, they, they push the hot air back in the uh, circular core of hot air, which is then uh, pulled down by huge fans, pushing it back into a uh, Water-cooled uh, radiator. We, we reuse, you know, so we produce uh, hot water with the system that is reused to, uh, for the heating of the, uh, the adjacent stadium. Uh, so basically, Kailas is a sun condensation system that was deployed in 2009. It's 960 disk less, uh, compute nodes, all with uh, you know, uh, 8 million cores uh, per machine. So 7600 and so on, and of course, it's two yards even only full by section, and there's no uh, internet connectivity to any of the computer so everything is done over uh, entry band you know, booting and management. And we've got about one petabyte of, uh, of luster storage. So, uh, is part of the larger computer cabinet network, so we offer the time freely to uh, any academic researchers in Canada. So, our users are come from a very diverse background. So about 75% of our compute time comes from uh, you know, engineering, bioinformatics, bio, uh, and uh, you know, chemistry, and the, the usual culprits in HPC, but we also have use you know, in uh, the humanities, economics, and the rest of that you know, that's awesome. It gets about 95% utilization rate, pretty much all of the time. So just to go a bit over how it's, it's, it was set up with Green Line, so we use one sys uh, for provisioning with stateless. Uh, obviously, since we don't have our lives, and we use Green Line as a scheduler and the resource manager for the, uh, the whole system in a single provision. Everything is tied together with a pretty extensive and unclean cluster of custom scripts that we had to, to write over the years to make everything work. Uh, and we're, as we go into the transition, we're finding more and more scripts that we have forgotten about. Uh, for example, we initially deployed a system with dynamic provisioning, because we wanted users to be able to request a job on a Windows machine, for example. And so we had done that with scripts that were tied into green and time, and we would just you know, reboot the machine in a new image before the job, would be, and, you know, the job was on hold before the machine was rebooted. <coughs> so it, it's really complex and really unclean script that we have. And since Green Engine is on that debug and on the management side, so we have you know, tied into its flat files uh, system to extract all the accounting and uh, reporting data and move it into a database server where we can mine it and extract whatever information we need. It's been working pretty well uh, for the past two years. So, as I said before, about 95% uh, utilization rate. Uh, at the given year, we have about 200 active users, and at any point in time, between 200 and 500 uh, running jobs 
on this system. So it gets peaks of maybe two, three thousand curves, uh, two, two, three thousand curves cube. But that was before we overall the our scheduler policy. So if it's working so well, why do we feel we need to switch to MOAB? <coughs> Basically, you know, we're from all the centers, the computing centers in Canada are the only hard one that is uh, running grid and blank. So we feel a bit alone in our own little place. And that combined with the fact that we're not very sure about the, the commitment of our vendor, which is Oracle. Uh, we looked at the open source alternative, you know, the, the new open source port of uh, grid and blank that we feel very fractured and it's mainly composed from uh, smaller users. So we didn't want to end up being the, the bigger pump, the bigger fish in the pump. So, uh, yeah. so we, we would rather have a, you know, a bigger users to help support us than us supporting smaller users. So Moab for us too as well. You know, it's already well known to most of our users as most of the large Canada sites already run here in Moab on our way. And single vendor to look at commercial support was a good thing for us. And Obviously, as point to get can we are to get some help when needed. So our basic plan was very simple. You know, we just take million line out and plug in Turk and you know Moab as a scheduler and everything should work fine, right? So we we had to look at the uh, you know implement the existing scheduling policy, train users, train staff, and part of our management scripts. And while doing that, gave a progressive control. Uh, of the system to uh, more after. So as Kipling fully said, we have implemented the system and that we have ported it into Moab. It's strictly based on shared tree, so we don't we don't add anything else in the equation. It's you know you've got your allocation and this will give you the the, the priority of your job. Don't don't increase the priority based on the time in the queue and other parameters like that. We assign dedicated nodes only because we, we have you know serial jobs also in the system we kept adding Users bumping to each other. A maximum to upgrade a job by, by project at any given time, and we've got four queues, you know, a 15 minutes queue, 24 hours, 48 hours, and a seven day queue that we, we, we try and keep users out of it. So it's a it's called a long queue because it's a long waiting time. We put less score into that, and we only gave, it, gave access to it to users who have a specific name for it. And analysts can override. Uh, uh, when users override right tickets to push higher priorities on job when needed, and obviously users can qualify to get access to more cars. So we have users running 2,000 cars jobs you know, daily on the system, but those that qualify with an uh, before that. And we use PSTR to override the restriction we put on the, uh, the water time on the machine. So that's the shared feed that we've set up on, in, uh, in Moab right now. It's a really flat shared tree, so we have a national allocation system. So any researcher that, that wants time on the machine uh, push in an allocation request at the end of the year and gets you know part of it. So some people have twenty percent of the machine allocated to them, and we keep another about twenty percent of the machine for user income allocation. And we expect them to be able to get uh, from point one to one percent of the machine at any given time. We don't quite like that model. We'd rather have you know something where 20%, 80% separation is enforced uh, in the shared tree. Because uh, at some points in, in the year, we may have you know, tens of new users uh, coming in with that allocation. We don't want that to unbalance the, the, the shared tree for people with a specific uh, allocation. So the user transition is the part where we're expecting to have the, the most of us. So when we, when we first thought of you know, playing the scheduler, we figured, well, our user would first they would be mad at us. And the, most of them we have to avoid adapting their submit file and you know, adapting the new commands on the system. It's proven to be fairly easy, uh, well, up until now at least. Uh, submit files are fairly similar, but the same, the same structure and seems to maintain the same uh, scheduling policy. It's been pretty uh, easy on that side for users. And we've even had good comments from users which MOAD has proven to be more responsive than Green Time MOAD. They get faster and sort their, 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 their command and their job gets queued faster. The staff transition is the part we have completely forgotten about. So in this, this one is this part is going to be a bit harder than we thought. 
basically our, our analysts that work with the, uh, with the researchers, which is all the support staff are, are at this time having to get at the whole workflow of working with the user, you know, looking at the, uh, at the queue, how do I know, you know what that, where that job was launched from, what submit file was used, and how the, you know, and what, what host, uh, what host file was used, what, what, what machine the job is running on, and the state of all the process. It's something that people are often having a hard time figuring out uh, how it works. So we have to do some more internal big management training to finish that, uh, that process. And the management script, so listening at all the presentation here, like this week, learning about all these things that the, and that Moab can do. But the way that we did the transition, basically, is that we, we un, like I showed earlier, we unplug Green and Giant and we put it Moab in its place. And we figured, well, we have one, two, three scripts that tie into that and extract information. We just need to update those ones. And as we go along, we keep hitting you know, older scripts or new stuff that we have forgotten about that we need to, to update. So seeing that we have kind of a big, a big cluster, a big spaghetti and around, and that we just put Moab you know, in, inside it. And so in the next couple of weeks and months, we'll have to uh, untie this thing and you know, uh, implement the, the real the Moab way of doing things, uh, make our system more more dish if you want. So uh, the issue we've been having is how to get the accounting for uh, internal databases we've been using. And another issue with monitoring and maintain, uh, maintaining the maintenance of the, uh, the, the, the copying nodes. So our deployment is being done in a progressive way. Uh, so Green and Giant Moab will live together for you know, the, the weeks and months to come. What we expect to do is the key is uh, we're going to give progressive control of, uh, of the, the cluster to Moab. So we've built a new one SSNH for uh, the Moab compute nodes. And we've, built, we've built all of our implement, MPI implementation to support Tor. So as we reboot, the, as we reboot compute nodes, they, they fall over to the Moab side uh, automatically. So we've started with 10% of the, uh, of the cluster. It says we've got 10 racks of compute nodes, so we gave one, we gave one rack to the Moab to control. And as time goes by, we Adding more rack to the, the system. So that was a bit fast because we were a bit short on time. But does anyone have questions about that, uh, that process or what we've been doing? <laughs>